Hey guys, uh, welcome back to my channel. I'm gonna do my second One Night in Cars on card review. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and go. All right, so our next new card is Babbling Book. Babbling Book is a 1-1 one, one creature. It's a rare, it's a mage exclusive. Uh, it has a battle cry that adds a random mage spell to your hand. I don't know how I feel about this card. It's kind of lacking in stats. I feel like it's not very impactful. It certainly doesn't fight well uh, with any of the decks that it would actually be coming down early against. It just doesn't feel like it really fits in any strong mage archetype that is in the meta right now. The only place I think you might see this card is actually going to be in Reno Freeze Mage, which isn't very good right now, but if you see a resurgence of Reno Freeze Mage, this card might get in in that 29th or 30th slot as just giving a little bit of extra value, a little bit of extra likely removal. Most mage spells are pretty good. Really, this card compares to Web Spinner. It's a 100 card, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1. When it dies, you get a random beast in your hand. So what you really have to think here is Web Spinner got play in Hunter, which is a more aggressive archetype. So the differences between the two are really Babbling Book gives you a spell instead of a beast creature, and Babbling Book is in Mage, which is traditionally not as face-oriented of an archetype. Uh, I feel like this card's probably just not good enough to show up in anything. I don't think you're going to see a lot of it. It's just a little bit too weak. If it was a 1-2 or a 2-1, that'd be a different story. But as a 1-1, one, one, I think you're not going to see it very much. It gets eaten by 1-2s. You know, the best it can do is trade up to two ones. There aren't a ton of two ones in the format right now, except in Zoo. And in Zoo, he's just a single guy. He can't really make a big difference. In Arena, fine. I mean, it's a one drop. One drops are always great. Um, you're going to be able to trade into two ones and one ones in an advantageous way a little bit more often in Arena. And getting an extra spell, it's free value, generally pretty good in Arena. So this card, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be heartbroken if you have to take it in Arena. Uh, it's not great by any means, but it's a one drop. It gives you some cards. It's it's decent. Next up, we have Malkazar's Imp. It is a 1-3 for 1. Uh, Warlock specific. It is a demon. And it has the effect whenever you discard a card, you draw a card. This card is either going to show up everywhere or nowhere at all, right? It's going to be very hit or miss. We're not really going to know until people experiment with it. I personally think this is going to be a two of in Zoo. And the reason I feel like that is because you see Doomguard and Soulfire often enough that this guy only has to get you one draw to be really good if you were going to play those cards anyway, right? So, like, normally you do want to play Soulfire or you want to play Doomguard on an empty hand because Zoo can achieve an empty hand very easily. But sometimes you have that one card that's left over or you have a coin when you're on the draw. And being able to discard that card and cycle it into something else effectively makes this guy a 1-3 draw card for one. And, I mean, we've seen Novice Engineer get play index sometimes. 1-1 one, one for 2 draw a card. Obviously, it's not super common, but a 1-3 one, for 1 draw a card, if you actually execute that, is great. If you happen to execute it more than once, the value is crazy. A 1-3 is a fine stat line. It can fight with 2 1s and survive. It can kill 1-1s. One, it only requires a small buff, like from a Dire Wolf Alpha or something like that, to kill something with 2 health. This is actually a pretty good card. I think you're actually going to see it a lot. I do not think you're going to see it in Reno or Handlock. I don't think it's got enough value there, ironically, despite being kind of a controlish card by nature. Um, and I don't think you're going to see a discard Warlock archetype like spring up from this. It's just not terribly likely, uh, in my opinion. Uh, in Arena, it's a 1-3 one, for 1. Sure, whatever. Who cares? That's good enough. Uh, if you get some synergy for it, then you probably won. Pretty good. Kara Kazam is a 5 cost warlock spell. It summons a 1 1 candle, a 2 2 broom, and a 3 3 teapot. So you're basically getting 6 6 worth of stats for 5 mana. It's a spell for whatever that's worth. The problem, however, is that it is a warlock spell, and warlock doesn't have any business casting a spell that does nothing to the board on the turn it is cast for 5 mana. The card itself is decent. It's roughly as good as like Silverhand Knight that gives you a 4-4 with a 2-2. Two, two. Gives you a, one more body because it gives you the 3, the 2, and the 1. It's the 4 and the 2. And more bodies is slightly better uh, in Warlock than it is in other archetypes. But I just don't think this card is good enough in Constructed. I don't see where it makes a, makes a deck that's popular right now. With the exception, perhaps, of some sort of Reno Jackson style warlock where again much like babbling book this might make it into the 29th or 30th slot as a I guess it does stuff kind of card that doesn't prevent you from taking the Reno Jackson heal. In Arena it's fine it's 6-6 six, six of stats for 5 mana sure why not it's a common so you're going to see it somewhat often you're going to see it slightly more often I would say than you see Silverhand Knight because again having three bodies is slightly better than two 
the AOE metagame in Arena isn't nearly as dominant because you're not guaranteed for your opponent to have AOEs. It's not the carefully tuned machines that you've seen constructed. So this card, I think, is fine in Arena. I'll be happy taking it. I won't be like ecstatic about it, but it's a common, so it's going to be a lot better often than commons it gets matched up with. Silverware Golem is a 3-3 three, three for 3. It's got no tribal benefit, and when you discard this minion, summon it. The thing I said earlier about discard lock not being a thing, this is the card that actually threatens this. I think there is a small chance you could see all the discard cards make it into one deck. Darkshire Librarian, uh, Imp of Malgazar, this card, Soulfire, Doomguard, etc., Tiny Knight of Evil, all that stuff. Maybe has enough synergy. The problem is that a lot of these cards aren't terribly great on their own, and so you're not going to be happy if you can't get the synergy off. You're going to not have enough value, you're not going to have the tempo because you're not playing Zoo, you're giving up those Zoo cards for this discard gimmick. I just, again, don't really think it's good enough. Um, maybe this discard-oriented Warlock deck will rise. I mean, I'm going to play it, <laughs> but I can't say that I honestly think it's going to be any sort of viable. It would best be like a kind of semi-viable fringe shitty deck kind of like old pirates were before they became a real archetype like you can play it and it's kind of capable of winning games but it's not consistent and i think that's the big problem here is these discard decks aren't going to be consistent and arena's card is a three three for three which is pretty bad uh, it's hypothetically possible that it would be better than warlock class rares that it's matched up against but feasibly it's really just going to be a non-pick in arena Protect the King! It's Unleash the Hounds, except that they all have Taunt and they're not Beasts and it's in Warrior. And because of those things, it's not as good. Uh, charge is way better than Taunt, uh, and Beasts are way better than not Beasts, and Warrior doesn't have the same utility for a bunch of little guys that Hunter does. So in every way, it's worse than its counterpart, therefore we can assume it's probably not super great. Um, once more, and we've said that a lot in this video, but that's just the nature of the cards they've designed, uh, this is probably going to maybe show up in Reno Warrior because it can mire the board a little bit. It can be an alternative to Brawl, since you can't do Brawls in Reno, uh, to Zoo and make a bunch of 1-1s. You actually might see Zoo starting to play like Shadow Flame or something again, uh, or something like that that can take out uh, a bunch of one health guys if this card becomes prominent, but I really don't predict that happening. It's just not strong enough. Uh, some people are going to try to do some kind of janky taunt bolster weird synergy protector deck, and it is just going to be yet another fringe fun theme tribal deck, which is cool. I like it when we have lots of fun decks, but it's just not good enough. Uh, in Arena, it's fine. It's a bunch of bodies. If you cast it when they have at least four guys, it's 4-4 four, four worth of stats with taunt. Sure, why not? Uh, the AOE vulnerability, again, is less important in Arena. This card is like a meh in Arena. Um, there are some warrior rares that it outclasses, you know, but it, generally you're not going to want to take this. Pompous Thespian is a 3-2 with taunt for two. You will never see it in Constructed. Nobody will ever play it. You can might as well just pretend this card doesn't exist for the purposes of Constructed. It's just not good enough. Basically, no neutral taunt minion with no other effect and a low health value is ever going to get play. We didn't see Tournament Attendee. We didn't even see Sparring Partner that is literally strictly better than this card, even though it's Warrior specific. But Warrior is the deck that would play a bunch of taunt guys for no reason. What I'm getting at is this card is fucking horrendous in Constructed. It's just terrible. Never going to see it. Just put it out of your mind. In Arena, meh, it's okay. Uh, it trades with three health things which is, you know, not as good nowadays as it used to be, since a lot of the minions that were introduced in the newest expansion aren't like these three health powerhouses. I mean, you still see Pilot and Shredder and things like that in Arena, and he can fight that, but uh, in the end, he's just going to die to some 2-1 or 2-2. He's a taunt. Uh, mediocre 29, 30th slot Arena deck filler, basically. Pompous Thespian uh, is certainly pompous in thinking that he will ever get played. Zoobot, or Zoobot, if you want to be really technical about it, is a 3-3 three, three mech for 3 that as a battle cry gives a random friendly beast, dragon, and murloc plus 1 plus 1 each. Uh, this card is like the curator's little brother who didn't realize that stats aren't as good as card advantage. Uh, at his worst, he's a 3-3 three, three for 3, which is really bad. If he hits one thing, then he's a 
plus one health Shattered Sun Cleric, which is still really bad. Uh, if he hits two things, then he's giving you 5-5 five, five worth of stats distributed across three creatures. Cool, you did it. But I can't really think of decks in which that's going to happen, and I certainly can't think of decks in which that would happen that would also want to give up a deck slot for Zubat. It just doesn't seem good. Ironically, it has no place in Zoo, which would have been really perfect, actually. What if it was just a like a like you said, three three for two or something? Then it would have been Zubat, right? It would have actually fit in. As it is, no good. Uh, in Arena, it's a 3-3 three, three for 3 mech synergy. If you've got a bunch of mech synergy cards, its value goes up. Otherwise, it's a 3-3 three, three for 3. It's not that good. Um, you're almost never going to be able to set up a board that's got two of the appropriate tribes. It actually makes this guy hit value town. So, yeah, this is a pretty mediocre card overall. Nether Spike Historian. It is a 1-3 neutral card for 2 that, if you're holding a dragon, discovers a dragon. This card is awesome. This card basically gives you a chance to add a secondary dragon into your hand so you can play your good dragons and you can keep these shitty, possibly shitty, secondary dragons that you've discovered for dragon synergy activations. Awesome. It's a really good card. The one three body is not fantastic, but it's much better than uh, the Museum Curator's one two body that's really kind of a hindrance. A one three can actually take a couple swings against the zoo deck, possibly take out two minions or at least both halves of a possessed villager or an Argent Squire, which is respectable. Uh, and the important thing is it's neutral, so it has the opportunity to show up in, in the various dragon decks. Dragon Control Warrior might play one or two of these just to get an early card advantage, since Warrior is very good at surviving the early game. I don't think Dragon Priest is as likely to do it. Uh, because Priest is bad enough already that they can't really afford to play 1-3s for 2 that don't have an immediate board effect. But you might see it in Dragon Warrior because Dragon Warrior has the staying power and the, the resilience and the tools to survive early game aggression. In Arena, absolute 100% unmitigated terribleness. It is unlikely to have the synergy. It's a shitty body. It's not as good as like a war bot. Like it, It's super, super bad. Don't take it in Arena. You'll never take it in Arena. If you pick like and dragon somehow, then you can take it, I guess. But it's really just not not worth it. Bookworm, bookworm. It's a pun, you see. It is a three six neutral dragon for six mana. The shadow word pains something. If you have another dragon in your hand, that's fucking great, right? And basically means it's a three six for four mana, and you get shadow word pain, assuming you play it when you have another dragon in your hand. That's fine. I mean, three six pretty much matches up with a four five. It's actually slightly better. There's a lot of really potent three health minions active in the meta game. Uh, SI six agent. Where's the SI7? I don't remember. SI7 Agent, uh, Ravaging Ghoul, Tunnel Trog, lots of really good three health minions that this guy can throw down against and survive, and also kill something with three attack or less. You can basically compare it to Stampeding Kodo, Stampeding Kodo being a 3 5 for 5 that kills a random two attack or less minion and is a beast. Uh, you can't control that. He's got one less health, but he costs one less mana. I think Bookworm's fine. Uh, I think Bookworm will show up in Dragon Warrior, like control-oriented Dragon Warrior. Maybe even a Dragon Paladin deck might come back together, since Paladin needs the targeted removal of that sort of stuff. Uh, Dragon Priest will probably play it. Possibly even Tempo Dragon Warrior will play it in place of Draconid Crusher to give it a little bit of extra control flavor while still keeping that kind of attacky Dragon Warrior flavor. It's good. Uh, in Arena, it's a 3-6 three, six for 6 that you'll probably not get any extra effect off of. Pass it. It's not good. Like a lot of the cards so far from this adventure, it just it really doesn't stand up to other similarly costed cards in terms of stats. And you're not going to get the synergies that you need to actually make it worthwhile. So Bookworm, Bookworm, Bookworm is a pass in Arena. Prince Malkazar is a pit fighter. He's 5-6. He's a demon. He costs 5, and he's neutral, which is interesting. Um, and his effect is that you add five legendary minions to your deck at the beginning of the game. What a weird effect. Uh, this is the sort of thing I've been wondering if Hearthstone's design space would ever touch on. I mean, you had cards like this that affect you in kind of a non-game action way in Magic the Gathering with the Leyline cards, uh, but this card, I think, is really bad. But I think it's really good that it exists, so let me explain that a little bit more. The card itself I don't think is very good. In most cases, 
the five random legendaries you add to your deck aren't going to be as good as the 30 cards you chose to add to your deck. The only exception to this is going to be if fatigue archetypes kind of rise back from the mist somehow using this as its, its keystone. It's only one card, but it effectively just adds five to your deck count, which is pretty sweet. Um, you could maybe see it in decks that are very slow and good at drawing a lot of cards. Again, Control Warrior or like Reno Handlock or something like that. Actually, no, you can't play it in Reno Handlock. Ignore that completely. If you do that and you lose, it's my fault. Blame me. Um, but you might see it in a couple of decks that are very slow, very value-oriented, uh, and are all about surviving the early game and taking total control of the late game. Besides that, though, uh, it just dilutes your deck. It slows it down. You're going to feel really, really bad when you need to top deck a certain card. Instead, you get Nap the Dark Fisher or the Boogeyman, right? So the, the, the backfire potential of this card is too great to justify the occasional excellence of the card. Uh, in Arena, it's actually a little bit better. Pit Fighter is a fine card in Arena. I don't really feel bad when I take Pit Fighter. I'm not just like, woo, Pit Fighter, but it's fine, right? I mean, it's it's the basically the standard for its slot. The problem is whatever this guy's up against will probably be better. But if you happen to get him and he goes up against, like, you know, Nat the Dark Fisher and the Boogeyman, you can take Prince Malkazar, and the lower power level of Arena means that the average power level of a legend, a legendary creature, is, like, higher in comparison to the average power level of Instructed. So Prince Malkazar in Arena is actually fine. He's one of the only cards on this deck that we've seen is better in Arena than it is in Constructed. Um... But overall, he's really interesting because it is opening up design space and it shows the developers are thinking very laterally and thinking very innovatively and thinking very creatively and they're going to come up with these cool effects that use the fact that it's a digital card game to its advantage and that's really what we need to see more of in Hearthstone. Medivh, the Guardian, is a 7-7 legendary creature for 8 and when he comes out, you equip Atiesh. The Staff of the Guardian. Uh, now, Atiesh, the Staff of the Guardian, is a 1-3 weapon, and it's interesting to note that Medivh himself is neutral, which means that now every class has another option if they want to do some kind of weird weapon-related strategy. Or, honestly, even if it just wants to be funny, every class has an extra option for a weapon now. But uh, Atiesh, the Staff of the Guardian, is a 1-3 weapon, that every time you cast a spell while it's active, you summon a random minion of the cost of that spell. So it's basically a, a mini summoning stone that you hold in your hand alongside your nice 7-7 seven, seven for 8 body. 7-7 seven, seven for 8 isn't amazing. It's not as good as like Dr. Boom, obviously, and the effect is a little slower. But I think you'll definitely see this actually in Priest. Um, I think you might see this in Freeze and Reno Mage. I think you're going to see it in decks that already cast a lot of spells often expensive spells in tombs flame strikes fireland portals other spells like that that are high mana cost and random creatures of that mana cost have a good chance of being potent and game changing um so yeah he's a really interesting card he's very feasibly costed for the stats i suppose hypothetically you might hit something for one damage with the staff but i think that's really unlikely uh, but yeah, he's just a very cool card. It's cool to see one of the, the iconic, the key characters for this expansion and for this adventure get a card that is actually pretty potent uh, to match him. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that you're going to see this in control decks, specifically Priest and Mage. In Arena, he's great. He's a 7-7 seven, seven for 8. Sure, why not? If you have any number of spells, you get it and you get some extra value out of it. He's good. If you cast him and he sticks and you cast a spell on the back of him, you'll probably win the game because you get an extra guy. Pretty simple. Uh, if you don't have a lot of spells, if you're playing a class that doesn't get a lot of good spells or a lot of good expensive spells, such as Warrior, you probably don't want him. But again, uh, Mage, Priest, even to a certain extent, maybe even... Uh, well, yeah, pretty much Mage and Priest <laughs> uh, are going to love this guy. And that pretty much wraps it up for my second One Night in Karazhan card review. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Validate my digital existence. Uh, down here below, just down like around, it's under the video. Um, if you enjoyed listening to my dulcet tones, we also do a weekly tabletop games stream. It's uh, at Wednesdays at 8 p.m. EST. Uh, we, meaning the Play Together Project, uh, we play tabletop games and we give a shit about politics and social justice. If you like those things, come on over there and like them with us. And if you don't like those things, then 
don't, I guess, but keep watching my videos and I'll keep talking at you and you'll keep listening and it'll be great for all parties involved. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. I, I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Okay.